Okay, well, um, thanks everybody for coming to this core conversation about usability. And as you see from the title, we are going to talk about usability, especially for site builders and administrators. And we come to that in a moment. But first of all, um, um, just use the ah, it's a Mac. It's my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Rachel. Uh, so I'm a site builder uh, primarily, and any code that I write is usually for patches for Drupal core, really, on this side, the type of stuff we're going to be talking about. Uh, and I work in the UK as a freelance, so if you need any work doing, give us a shout. <laughs> Um, and I'm Antje, or Ifrik in the issue queue. Um, I'm a biologist by training. I started building lots of websites for the kind of NGOs I'm working with. And this microphone is in a weird space. Um, and I started actually with writing documentation. And then I realized that it's really annoying to write documentation to explain people how things work when they don't quite work. So actually, I'd rather improve the usability so I don't have to write documentation. Um, so I've been part of the usability team for quite for a year or so mm -hmm. now um, and we have been talking about usability and issues about the admin menu for doing a few sessions and I'm glad to see that there's even more people and we can show you some of the issues we still had had a year ago and we still have them um, but first let's ask a bit about who are you in the room actually um, who of, is working on core and contrib modules Who's more a site builder? Um, mm -hmm. who's, a, who's the front ender or themer? Who has to change the usability of Drupal to make it useful for your clients? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and then we have another, one other question um, with regards to the admin toolbar that we have in Drupal. Um, who's using the toolbar in a horizontal line? Okay. Uh. Okay. Uh, who's using the toolbar mainly in a vertical line? Wow. Ah, did you know that there's way more options in the, when you put it vertically than if you have it horizontally? Which means you can actually go... You don't see mm -hmm. a lot of these. Mm -hmm. You don't see them on the horizontal screen at the moment. You can go three levels deep without any new page load. Um, so <laughs> okay, but that explains why when we write an issue, nobody actually figures this out. <laughs> Okay, so usability. Um, the main question is, of course, who's the actual user we're talking about? And in this session, um, we talk about site builders, front, front, end, uh, front enders, and advanced administrators. <coughs> the site builder is usually the person who, who uses Drupal as a tool to build something for somebody else. So you use Drupal, but you also make it usable for somebody else. Uh, the front-ender also needs to use Drupal to actually prepare the site so it matches the design. Um, front-enders, for example, typically also need to access the um, display this content type, um, display these fields, those issues. Um, and the administrator are usually our clients, the users that use the website on a daily, on a daily basis to do, do the actual work. So for them, the finished Drupal site or the finished whatever you build with Drupal, is their actual tool to do the work. So in the context of this session, we talk a lot about the kind of more professional users, um, the users that have actually invested into Drupal by spending time learning it, um, by spending their day hours working with it. Um, and they are also the ones that are quite often involved in the question on whether to use Drupal for the next project. Yeah, oh, yeah I mean, they're the people who have the ear of the person who is paying your invoices. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they get to say whether you continue to get paid. Um, for the people in the back, just come in and sit down. There's one more chair in the front and there's space on the floor here as well. Um, so we're, we're not explicitly talking about the kind of first time user, about the, the people who are, want to set up a website in a day or so but we're pretty sure that the improvements we envision will also help them. But mainly we do actually talk about people that will spend their time figuring out, trying to find the same page again and again, this kind of things. So what can we improve? Um, the navigation, and that's mainly the admin menu. The permissions, 
UI texts and UI and UX standards. Are we going to go through them one by one? Yeah, absolutely. Now, as Dries, as Dries uh, mentioned in uh, the Dries note, um, there's lots of t people talking about adding new technologies there, uh, adding things like you maybe using a JavaScript framework to make it more a, a richer experience doing the admin. Even if that was done, the main fundamentals need to be right. So work that continues now, even though we're using HTML to present it, um, without JavaScript particularly, it still matters. And it will still matter, even if we have the most amazing JavaScript framework in the world uh, running the admin interface. All of the things we're going to talk about today still completely apply. So, um, about the admin admin navigation, let me just give you three examples on the, where do I, for example, where do I make this specific admin page visible for some users? Um, well, you first list all users, and then you go from there. Um, that's the permissions are on the people's page, which you mm -hmm. might know, but it's not obvious. Um, where do I edit or translate a specific block on the page? Well, you first go to the layout page, where the layout of the whole site is defined, and then you go to the custom block library, and there you can edit or translate a block. Um, or where do I see all media items? Um, with media in, in core, um, well, actually, you list first all articles and pages and so, and when you have done that page load, you go to the media items. Um, so basically what we're doing in the admin, in the admin menu is we have to teach our users detours we have to tell them that if you want to set permissions, you first need to go to people. If you want to see media items, you first go to content. If you want to change the welcome message that a new user gets in the email, you go to the account setting somewhere at the bottom of the page. So instead of providing a predictable interface where you could say, I think I should be there, we're actually teaching people, you can't go from A to B, you have to go from A through C to B. Um, there are some easy changes for that. Um, there are some issues for that. For example, there's an issue to actually change the content page to make it something like the structure page. So you wouldn't have to go through note content to go to media content. Um, there's also issues about um, moving the permissions and roles pages to move it into configuration of the user account and not as part of the here's all users of your site. Um, we, we would like to move the custom block library from block layout to block to the actual content because they are content entities. But in order to do that, we will also need to change the permissions because you can only go to that custom block library page to even if you want to just change the opening times of your shop for Christmas, you will have to have all the permissions to move all of the blocks, to go to that tab on that page to then have some, some editor type in that you're going to be closed on Christmas Eve. Um, that's not a sane workflow. Um, it also means you're, um, you have to give way too many permissions to, to people. So we come to that later. But so, so as an example, if you think about it, if somebody in the office of the client has the ability to change the telephone number, <coughs> which is a reasonable expectation in your footer, <coughs> you're also giving them the permission to move things around. If they move them around and it breaks the site, it's your fault in their minds. We know it's not, but actually it is. It's your fault the site's broken. Um, and coming back to the content page, um, you know the content page actually acts different than all the other points in the menu item because it's actually loading a view of all nodes. Um, which very much made sense when we moved from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, because in Drupal 6 we had, under content, we had create content types and the content and some other things. So with the move to Drupal 7, it was decided, okay, content should just be nodes. That was fine in Drupal 7, but we're now in Drupal 8. Content is not only just nodes. Content is also media in core now. Content is any custom entity you make. But still, we end up with something there this is a, 
this is a screenshot from a very simple site I've been working on that already has 10 tabs on the content page. And I can't just make menu items on the content because that page is kind of locked in. Um, so we need to work on that. It will break some documentation that says you find content if you click on content, um, but I think we need to actually accept that we break that. Um, so this is just tabs on the content page, and you had so, some examples? So on sites that I've built for clients recently, um, I've been adding entity types, uh, which is kind of new for me, it's great, um, for things like uh, points of interest all around the world. Now, I want to have all of my content of the site in one place, so it makes sense to the, makes sense to the uh, client. That's currently quite hard because, as you can see, it turns into this crazy mess of uh, tabs and it doesn't make sense to the end user. Uh, one of those links is to change the whole of that content page, as it's described at the moment, to be more like structure. So what you'd have is you'd go to content and then you'd see a list of the different types of content. You would see nodes, you would see media, you would see files, you would see my custom point of interest, because it's then easy as me as a module developer to, go me, module developer, um, to add that link there, yeah? Uh, at the moment, it's kind of a mess, and we need to get there. So there's an issue to actually change that. We need to communicate that well, because it will mean what we want to do is encourage people to work consistently across lots of modules so that we can do that. All users care about is consistency. We can make decisions about what we think is right, but it needs to be right for everything. Um, there's, just, there's more space on the floor here if people want to come in. Um, there's still one chair here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we... Mm -hmm. we Okay. Um, yeah, come, come through. Seriously, you can sit on the floor here. I'll try not to stand on you or anything. It's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not promising, mm -hmm. but I will try. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. okay. And yeah, if, if you can make a bit of space um, in case there's any... Thanks. Um, so yes, um, as... What we see when we build sites for users, that is, it's much easier if we can provide them with something that's consistent. If I can tell them, if you want to edit something that's content, then it's under content. A block with your, your contact details or so should live somewhere where you can actually find it. You shouldn't have to go through other detours. Um, so there's a number of issues um, that are open and that need, need work, so you're happy to come and join us working on that on, on Friday during the sprint. And there's also is, there's a one longer term issue. Um, we would like to actually develop some kind of guidance for module developers to see where should I actually put my module? Because currently when you make a contrib module, you can just pretty much put it everywhere. You can put all, everything under structure or under configuration or you can make a new top level menu item or you can spread it over the, the the site, there's no kind of guidance, which means also that, <coughs> which means it's also not predictable for users to find something. Um, we don't want to go to kind of a long, endless bike shedding of saying this page should live here and this page should live there. Um, what we are trying to develop and have been since, have been discussing that um, in different different groups since Death Days in Milan, I think, mm. is if we could come up with something like five questions does this con concern users? Does this concern content that's actually pro produced on the production side? Um, is this something you actually need to access on the production side? Um, if we can maybe find a kind of five question, pick your own adventure, um, and find a predictable way of where to place admin pages, we would probably also provide something that's more predictable for the users. Um, and it would probably mean we could also turn off whole sections of the admin menu on the production side. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So, um, 
Permissions and access. Um, we'd already pointed out that there's problems with permissions. Um, again, let me give you three examples. So any user who needs to fix a typing error. Um, so any user who needs to edit the content of a block. Um, yeah, can remove any block from the site. <coughs> um. It's actually quite scary, that. Yes. <laughs> and I think um, site builders, we've talked to different site builders, and lots of us are kind of making a workaround. Yeah. Um, the problem is we can't remove, we can't move this custom block page somewhere different. Um, or we can, I've been starting to simply duplicate that page and put it somewhere and not tell the user that they actually have this permission to change these other things in the hope that they don't discover it. Because there's only one single permission for blocks. Anything you do with blocks is done with the one single permission. So we can't fine tune this. Um, but and that, that, it's currently done with one permission. Yes. There's We're an issue. Here saying that we should be changing that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Anybody who wants to edit a taxonomy term via the admin menu, for example, to add images to taxonomy terms or um, any site where you don't have a page per, um, per taxonomy term, well, if you want to edit a term like that, you can actually ch change the default language of the vocabulary. Um, <laughs> that's not necessarily related. I need an, I need an editor when I have a free free tagging field, for example, once in a while to go in and say, ah, these two words are actually the same, I merge them, or I fix a typing error, or I add, add an image. Um, I don't want them to say, hmm, they should all be in English or German, or, but they can. This is the, the page they see, for, they see when they want to add, um, when they want to edit a taxonomy term. And any user who needs to access one single page under structure, for example, the custom block library, um, gets 10 configuration pages without any admin items. Um, because we can only... <laughs> uh, we, there's only one permission that says see admin pages that gives you access to structure, configuration and help in one go. Um, and if you don't have anything on the configuration pages, these 10 submenu items still all appear. And every single page might say you don't have any administrative items. <laughs> now, that means I'm providing my users with, with an admin menu that is cluttered with, with empty pages. Um, this issue is nine years old. <laughs> so, uh, so um, if you'd like to fix it, great, go for mm -hmm. it. <laughs> um, so, my experience with permissions is that the lack of the not being able to fine-tune these permissions means it puts the integrity of the site I'm building at risk and it's confusing the users. I can't seriously hand out a site to somebody who only needs to translate content and give them access to, yeah, maybe to remove the branding or to remove the main content or so. Um, so we need to have more permissions. Um, the usual reply then is, uh, but the permissions table is already so long and so confusing. Yes, it is. But I'm looking at that permission tables when I set up the site for the users. Um, I do that once or a few times. And then I'm done with it. The editor, the administrative users that are using the site on their daily work, look at this um, admin menu every day. So even if I'm dealing with a table from hell that goes from here to to somewhere, um, it's still a better usability for the end product if we can actually have more permissions, if we can have three permissions for blocks, for example, instead of just one. Obviously, we should fix the permissions table. Um, we should fix the permissions table, yes. That's an issue that's also very long standing. And, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh -huh. um, but if we, if we wait for the permissions table to be fixed, we are still putting sites out where every editor, every translator can remove your branding from the site. So I think we should just live with um, not having the permissions tables fixed before we add. Um. Yeah, there's also a situation where if you, you've got those conflicting issues, now, the thing is, we've been living with the permissions table being a bit long and kind of got away with it for probably about Decades. nine years. <laughs> um, so... The other stuff as well, so the argument, I think, uh, 
that yeah, place. but it does. But because because the permissions don't exist currently, and we're reticent to put them there because of the permission table, it should it should be the other way around. We should have the permissions, which means that we're more likely to realise that it's a proper issue with that table and do something about it. Because at the moment we kind of live with it, yeah. And then maybe if we do the permissions properly, it will force our hand. And more people in this room and other rooms will go, hey, let's do something about that. So how, how about we work on both of that parallel? We add more permissions, and somebody else works on the permissions table, and whoever gets first is done first. Um, there, there is no, there's no reason. Um, there, there might also be other options of kind of um, dealing with this, maybe in the oh, short term. Where did that go? What did you do? Um, I'm missing a page. Oh, oh no. Um, uh, so um, I've actually asked people on how they decide to actually set their permissions. And it's a bit like, mm, mm, there, there isn't really any kind of standards for it. There isn't any, um, so quite often we end up with a module that does an amazing amount of things. Um, and everybody who gets access to that module can all of these things. Um, and then stepping back and saying, ah, should we now actually remove some of them? Um, is, an, is an extra work, but I think it would be good if as module developers, you can get some guidance on saying, where sh where, what extra permissions should there be? It shouldn't be just be, there's one permission and be damned and figure it out. Um, we could, for example, say, if a task is more a site building task, a task that is done before the site goes live, it might need a different permission than anything you do with the module when the site is on a production site. That would be a very simple two different permissions. You could also say, if things end up on different pages. There's probably a reason for that. Um, so if part of your, your um, functionality of the module is on one page and the other part is on another, maybe that's a reason for two different permissions because you're clearly doing two things. Um, we could also hack something as simple as um, we have the, the bit of the help text in, um, at the top of the judgment page Maybe we could have simply, simply having as simple as a, as a link here saying, the access to this page is controlled by this permission, and if you click on it, you just come to that permission. Um, now, especially beginning site builders end up on the, what do, which permissions do I need to enable to get to here or there? So we quite often see in, in sites that are built by people who, who are less experienced um, that too many permissions are given simply because you just want to make sure the user can X something. Um, because that's better, because otherwise you get the, the calls or the issues on the, I can't see, um, and then you just go and say, oh, I give you a permission. Um, so there might be different ways of tackling that, but I think, well, we do need them. Um, user interface texts. <laughs> uh, that's, that's another issue, um, and that's, that's text like the label on a field, the page headings, the page headings and tab headings and sub, sub, uh, secondary tab headings, but also the kind of blur, blurbs on a site that, or on a page that explain you what this admin page does, as well as all the help text or the whole full documentation on Drupal.org. And we find, and that's a quote from the from a um, session yesterday. We find mod module developers and core developers saying, well, I'm happily sitting down 12 hours to write this code, but I'm not gonna spend 30 minutes on writing any help text for it. Um, and there's lots of good reasons for that. For example, on the, well, I don't actually know what to put in it. Am I making an explanation here, documentation for my other developers? Do I explain something to a site builder? Is it something for the end user? Um, is it so far disconnected that it lives on Drupal.org on a white page where I've spent months and months working on this and now I sit in the front of this white page and I have to write up a documentation? I don't even know anymore what needs documenting because 
as a module developer, I know everything inside out. I don't know which the things are that people don't know. Um, or it's also the, I'm not a writer. Um, I'm a developer, I can write the code, but I don't know how to write a good text that helps people along. Um, and that's even more the case if you then also have to write it in a, in a language that's not, new, not your native language. So, so we have lots of UI texts on the sites that are just gonna get, end up there. Um, we have some guidance about which words to use, but they're kind of long and rambling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they actually need editing. Um, so we, as a community, we should discuss only who should actually write this documentation. Um, who can we, how can we help those new users that look at your module for the first time to maybe write a documentation that's useful for them? Um, and also, quite often, when you look at a module and you've finally figured out how it works, um, it's very hard to go back and say, okay, I make a patch to change this text because you continuously feel like you step on somebody's toes. Um, sometimes it's like, even if you fix a typing error or so, um, or if you say, your help text doesn't, your introduction here doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but it still feels like we are treading on people's toes. Um, and we should find a way of encouraging people that use our modules to actually say, this, here's, here's room for improvement. Um, or the other way around, maybe a module developer can actually say, here's my module. Can somebody who actually knows about writing um, help me with writing these texts? Yeah, so who were the module developers here? There was a few, wasn't there? So when you want to look for people to get involved, how do you go about that currently? Do you just kind of wait for it to happen type thing? Fame. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, sorry. Oh, yeah. I just want to ask you a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, it, I try to be very excited when someone comes in with a little issue and try to motivate them to help out and do a little bit more than what they originally were planning on doing. But make it, make it nice, right? You don't want someone to go through a nightmare, but it's like someone comes up with, with a little fix, like, oh, I think you need to fix it like this, but I can't write a patch yet. All right, let's help you out. Um, Maybe. That means that next time they know what to do. Yeah. Have mm -hmm. really make this way easier. Michael, can you repeat for the recording the salient bit since no one can get to the microphone? So it's very upsetting. Okay, so one of the things that uh, Bart has mentioned is the fact that when somebody comes in to the, his issue queue, um, he will obviously help them deal with the issue that they came with, but try to take them that little bit further and engage them so that they continue to be interested in doing other things. Is that a reasonable description? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Being a nice user, but it's also definitely self-interest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There's nothing wrong with having self-interest in terms of writing a, um, a, uh, a module. That's okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so who, who at Drupal Commerce? Boy and Z. Oh, Boy and Z. Yeah. He basically told me a while ago. Uh, Could you just get to the microphone? As soon as he's become a, yeah. <laughs> so to speak on behalf of Boyan, um, what he told me a while ago was he tries never to answer someone's question in his issue queue, except with a link to a recently written handbook page that he wrote for the occasion to answer that question. So we won't have to do it again next time. <laughs> um, but. Um, the, the, as a module developer, how about if you actually make an issue for your own module and say, this needs documentation, this needs theming, or this needs design? How we turn the, um, this a bit around? Because now it always feels on the, as somebody who's done documentation, you have to come to the module. I don't know who needs help. What would be cool, perhaps, for that kind of thing is that a way to flag we need help for this on the, on the module page, rather than creating an issue. Many people won't look in the issue queue looking for a ticket like that, but might, might be able to, if a developer could flag in some way on, Dru on Drupal.org on the module page, hey, I would like some people to help me write some documentation. 
Yeah, and I'm, you know, uh, a visual flag there so that they know the person writing the module is open to that. That might stimulate people to contribute where they they might be more hesitant if they're afraid of stepping on somebody's toes. I really I really like that as a, as a, as an idea. And there's nothing to stop you as module developers already doing that because you've got complete control over your module's introduction page. However, what would be nice is if it was done in a consistent manner uh, because that way people would see it in a consistent manner and then it would come forward. I think, actually, what I would do is turn that back on the module developers and say, okay, how are you going to do that? How are you going to get together, come up with a consistent way of doing that, and do it? Yeah, you can do that. It's going to make your life easier. Absolutely great. You're here, you're all together. Get together tomorrow, make it happen. Could make a ticket and then have some kind of icon on some kind of visual representation that everybody agrees upon and link directly to the ticket from the introduction page. That way, you cover both the ticketing part and, uh, and the fact that it's visible. But of course, we'd have to be able, we, we as a community would have to find some standard icon we want to use or some standard phrasing we want to use to, to do that. I think that's one of the great things about DrupalCon, is that quite a lot of you are all in one place. Get together, talk. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, talk. One of the great things about being at a big event like this is you can physically, I was going to say physically grab people, but that might not be quite right. Um, it's just the way I talk. Uh, talk to each other. Find people who are Drupal developers, creating contrib modules. <coughs> talk to each other. Agree, get the whiteboards. Agree a standard. Write it up. I would suggest in the project Drupal org um, queue would be a good place to do that. Agree it. Propose it, make it happen. You are more than capable. And you have, you have the authority to do it. You have the facilities to do it. You just need to talk. That would be amazingly, an amazing thing to do. Yeah, it might be counterproductive to what we are trying here, but I usually spend more time on Drupal Stack Exchange than on Drupal Org documentation. And I subscribe to a keywords that relate to modules that I made. And then publish and then uh, try to help it because then I get the feedback either it helped them or it didn't help them. And also I get to know the different use cases that people have. And if I write documentation, I, which I did for a module long ago, which is probably now a bit outdated, the documentation, then I don't really know who is reading this and if they understand it or not and if it relates to any use case or where if the starting point where I started this thing uh, is really a good starting point where people want to start to read or if this is more I'm coming from the wrong direction or something. So it helps to have, also for in the issue queue, I don't really care so much about patches. And I just want to know how people use the thing and um, if they have some ideas. And then if they actually upload a patch, then it's probably I'm not happy with it anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then it's more important than that they actually explain what they want to achieve. And Great. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we discussed that yesterday in a buff already as well on the, um, that with lots of documentation, we are not quite sure for whom it actually is or what they need to know. Um, so um, one of the proposals was also on the, maybe we should have actually a few questions um, that we could ask on the, what does this module do? Does it include, does it, um, does it bring any new field type, for example, or, um, those kind of gu guiding questions to actually get some documentation started, for example. Um, yeah. Let's talk a bit also about UI and UX standards. Um, because, um, well, as, as I said, consistency would be really great. Um, and I think Drupal 8, we have actually um, included a lot of that. For example, the order of the cancel, save, and delete button and how they should look like. Um, there are kind of standards for that. But if you look on Drupal.org, um, you'll find a page that says, here are the, the um, UI standards for Drupal 7. Um, and we need to actually see whether they still apply. Um, and we should go and actually look at, at Drupal. Uh, sorry, we should actually look at our core modules, whether they really all follow these UI standards. Because if we can make core very consistent um, and also explicitly say, 
why are do we why are do why are we doing this? Why do we have um, the add a new entity button always at the top there, saying it's a primary link and therefore it's always getting displayed in the same way? Um, then we sh it should also be easier for contrib modules to follow that that kind of patterns, that kind of standards, because um, we can make core very consistent, and then you install a contrib module and suddenly the yes, I want to delete this purger button is really big and blue. Um, <laughs> um, and there's some, some other issues where you think, hold on, this is the other way around, or why is this now in one really long form while everywhere else we have several forms next to each other or so. Um, so if we can make core consistent, we actually have something that we can point other users to for contrib modules, because most users, most site builders, they work with contrib modules. They're not only using core. So we also need to make this space um, across the whole uh, across the whole Drupal ecosystem. Yeah. And so, so we 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 can write the, we can both make Drupal 8 core consistent, but we can also write down what that consistency is. Uh, it's not currently there at the moment, and it hurts you. I saw a, a, I saw a good example in a, something that was tweeted, and this is from the Apple website, the Apple developer website. And every new user interface widget, process, whatever you want to call it, they describe not just what it does and how to code it, but they describe how to sensibly use it and what things should look like. It's not, it's not complicated large amounts of content. It's not unreasonable for us to create and be just as good at doing this as Apple are. Um, these, it's just saying, put things in sensible places. This bit about augmented reality. Well, it's augmented reality. Use the whole screen. Why would you not do? Um, and it's saying reasonable things. Each, each of the kits that they do, they describe what it does and how to use it as a developer as a site, you know, in there. It's all there, and we can do this. The only hesitation I have there is what's reasonable for one person isn't necessarily reasonable for another. I was in uh, Morton's presentation on his 11 theme, and I liked a lot of what I saw. Of in, that's really, in some cases, very different to what we're doing right now with Drupal and Drupal Core. There were things I didn't like. And I think I'm, I'm actually absolutely sure that there were other people in the room who, who had the exact same thought as me, except that the stuff I didn't like, they liked, and the stuff I liked, they didn't like. Yeah. So we're a community. Well, oh. Apple is, is, in the end, a top-down company. So oh, it's easier so. for the, them to, <laughs> to realize this, because in the end, there's one person who decides, yes, it's this way. And it's a lot less obvious for us to do it. I, I agree that core should be consistent. I do think that there is a danger in enforcing consistency, even at core level, uh, because it might put off people as so much as it helps them. We, we do have governance and process for this in yeah. core. Mm -hmm. like we, we have a usability team. We have usability maintainers who meet once a week, who, um, like when there's a proposed change, so that those, whatever patterns and documents would go to that team. And I think also one of the things that um, we can provide is making sure that um, lots of the functionality actually be, stays in a way that it can be customized. Um, so if I don't want a certain admin, uh, if I don't want a certain menu item, I should be able to just disable it. Um, if I, and that's a great thing with having views in core, for example, that most admin pages are views or most listing pages are views. So if I need to display a certain information to my users, I can do that. We don't actually have to go through the, what is the 80% use case for this table and then fix it. Um, if, we can, if we can keep things in a way that the site builders can customize it um, using the default tools, default widgets, then it doesn't actually make any difference what kind of admin theme we put on top of it. Um, and it also means that if you build your module following these, 
um, you can either put seven on it or 11 or whatever admin themes and it shouldn't break. So I would have loved to actually go through the session and say, what are, what are our um, UX standards? Um, how can you apply them? What are the things that we're discussing in the weekly UX meeting? Um, and so I still feel that we still have to actually say, why do we need UI standards? Why do we need UI standards on this, that live on the same kind of level and importance of coding standards? I mean, we have a coding standard that says a line should be 80 characters. But you could, if that would be a UI standard, we would probably be in comment 267 <laughs> and still discussing on whether it should maybe be in 85 or maybe be 75. Instead, we say, okay, it was the old terminals that had 80 characters. That's our standard. It's not the only solution. It's our standard, and we stick to that. Um, so we need UI and UX standards for providing a consistent user experience, both for core and contrib. Um, we need to document the reasons why we're doing that. Not o quite often we have really good ideas and then they're discussed and they're implemented, um, but not necessarily written down, why have we decided this? What is the reason for it? What might break if we do it the different way? Um, and would also help us to avoid this endlessly long bike shedding in issue queues. If I can say, this, this line of code is too long, here's the coding standard, should be 80 characters. Um, this um, page title should not be um, a question, but it should just be um, three, v three nouns or something like that. Um, we have a page that says, do you really want to delete this thing? Um, so, um, so if we can actually point to specific standards, it would actually um, make the issue queues more workable. Because at some stage, you just look at an issue and think, yet another comment about something that we have discussed here or there. And, um, it just goes around in circles and circles. So yeah, and, and, and sta standards are not fixed. They change over time. We go through an approval process, part of the community. You know, we, we get there and we change them and we improve them over time. But at least having them <coughs> gets us somewhere. And then if we're finding that something is inappropriate in the future, we change it. We do that with the coding standards as well, as it happens. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're defining some <coughs> UX and UI standards simply by doing things, by being the first module to do this, um, which is not necessary. Um, we also actually document what we do. I think we're getting much better in that with the, the governments and the UX meetings. Um, another step is on the how do we actually use them and how do we promote them to others. Um, I've been working with, an issue, with a module last week that was actually using a different WYSIWYG editor that was coming from some external library. We think, why? Why can't you just use the one we have? Um, why can't I point you to something and say, this is our standard? Is there a good reason why you're not doing that? And this brings us to the main question, the who's responsible for usability? Um, obviously, when we make core, when we make modules, we are responsible for that. But the people knowing how to write the PHP code aren't necessarily the ones or the only ones who know how to do usability testing, how to write a good, coherent help text. Um, they're not the only ones who can do design, for example, as well. So I think we need to put the, um, first of all, what we previously mentioned, if developers can also say, I've got an issue with my module that somebody should help. Um, we currently have all our issues in this kind of silos of core and this contrib modules. Um, we don't really have kind of um, issues that are more for, the, for this cross-cutting expertise. If as a designer I say, I want to help with some visual improvements, I wouldn't need to go through all the individual modules. For usability, we're now using one of the tags that kind of adds up as the kind of free, free for all, um, and we look at anything that's tagged with usability. But that is a really big mix of bags. Um, as an accessibility expert, it's difficult to say which issues are, who needs help. Um, so it feels like we should actually more actively have these issues, help us, and use this text, and maybe change the issue queue to also have something where you could say, OK, I'm, I'm on this cross-cutting expertise. Who needs my help? Um, 
that's a long-term plan. So who's responsible for usability? Well, who's responsible for usability? Well, you are. Everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've seen this picture yet. Um, <laughs> it's every single person in this room influences what that is. So make sure it's done right. Yeah. Um, who, who here has not tried to do any changes to interface text, etc., and all those type of things before? Anybody who's never tried to do any of that? Oh, never. wow. You've all got involved in changing Drupal core interface stuff before. Really? <laughs> or modules. Mm -hmm. Oh, for clients' projects. Yeah. Forget clients' projects. Who's tried to do anything on Drupal? No one? Anyone yeah. not done that? Who has or who hasn't? Who I hasn't? Knew, <laughs> who hasn't? Who can't remember? Who can't remember? <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, I think it's also a good point. Every time we repeatedly change something for a client site, it's something that probably should actually be fixed upstream in core. Yeah. Um, I had one of these small issues on the, on the content page. Um, that lists all the content on the node page. Um, it had three filters on top of it, the title, the language, the publication set, status. And I realized at some stage that for every single project, um, I was moving the filters around so that they would line up with the columns underneath. Um, and at some stage I thought, that's silly. Um, <laughs> it's actually a patch that, it, because it's a view, as a site builder, I can actually change that. I can change it, it's a YAML file, it's a patch in core that is simply a YAML file that changes something so that I don't have to do this with my projects anymore, which means some other site builders don't need to do this anymore either. Um, so I think everything that as site builders we repeatedly do to make it workable for our clients is probably an issue that we should try to fix upstream. Um, so for that we um, also have the sprints on Friday, but um, I think... I mean, really... You can be involved in this. You can do this stuff. You can save your, yourselves having to do the same changes every t for every client site. You have that capability. Um, it's an enjoyable exercise as well. The <coughs> for those in the room that have never written a line of code in their life or used Git, you're the best people in the world to have at things like code spr uh, contribution sprints because you can ask the questions and sit with someone who can turn those questions into a change that makes your life better. Yeah? Mm -hmm. That's why you need to work together. And I think that's where we stop talking. Okay. Um, we have about 15 or 20 minutes for discussions. Um, I suppose the people sitting on the floor might now need to get up. Um, but Come and tell us something. <laughs> I'm not that tall. <laughs> Hi. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, Otherwise, no. come stand here. It's higher. Oh. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> no, you I'm don't have to leave. I'm wondering, but... does Drupal um, Core have like the ability to do some sort of style guide in a usability sense? Like you were talking about X line of code or whatever. You know, could you do some examples of good examples and have that as a public-facing page um, for people? Yes, it points at Drupal 7, but it, it is old and needs updating, and you can do it. Okay, I, I didn't mean that people need to leave, I just meant that they need to make <laughs> space for the microphone. <laughs> um, no, actually, um, there is an idea for, um, together with the, um, with the accessibility initiative, to actually go through a few pages and check whether they fit all the accessibility standards, but also our UI standards, that we then can say, okay, this is a kind of gold standard admin page, and kind of work our way through that, so that you have a few reference pages. Um, to answer for the recording the question about this, the style guide for um, core interfaces, it's, it's, if you look for, search for human interface guidelines on Drupal.org, there's a very outdated handbook page that has that, so that would be the place to, that we would want to update and and find a way to make it more obvious right so, um, so that people like you who have the question I wonder if can find that instead of knowing in the back of their head that if once upon a time if you typed 
Hig, H-I-G, question mark, and IRC, like that was the only way I knew to find it. So obviously it's not very discoverable. Um, was the documentation pages got rearranged on Drupal.org? Yes. So there now is a page that has um, this kind of documentation and that actually has the coding standards on the same level as the, um, the UI standards. Um, and in preparation for this Drupal con, I actually made a big meta issue to say we need to go through these ones to have the human interface things in there, to have screenshots from Drupal 8, um, to have a comparison on how should this look like. Um, and so yeah, that's, that's work that needs, oh, that, yeah, that's pages that need updating and therefore work that needs done. Yeah, uh, back to the thing we talked about, the permissions and the long list and, and so on. Um, I have worked with a client and I'm going to throw this out, maybe someone can see if this will work for core or if there are some application for it. But we had a customer that has like 10 different roles and the roles are put on users by subscriptions. They have kind of automated flow for that. But what a subscription should be allowed to uh, see and use, it was kind of determined by the permissions. And we have this kind of functionality, we call it monitoring, where you could monitor monitoring different uh, taxonomy terms by flagging them, and when we have an overview page. So in order to have that functionality, you actually need three permissions. You need the flag, unflag, and also the permissions for the page, overview page. So, and we have like 10 different of this kind of functionality that the business has uh, kind of requirements on. And the uh, CAO kind of changed his mind about the subscriptions weekly. So we ended up doing this kind of grouping of permissions. So I have a separate page, uh, did a hook, where different custom modules can define a set of permissions needed for this functionality. Um, so then you have this overview page where you can say, okay, enable monitoring and it will enable those permissions for those rules. And then if you disable or remove the permissions, it will move all of them. And it can also check if you have two or three permissions, you maybe need to fix this. Um, it's just an ID, uh, maybe something like that for like administrating taxonomy terms, what permissions do I need to do this? Or if you need this kind of like, kind of some of a wizard or groupings or yeah, I have not think that through, but I think that could be one way to solve these problems with a long list of permissions. Yeah, there, there are things like that, especially if you're talking about things that are repeating. So you've got lots of entities and you need separate permissions for each. My immediate, my immediate thinking on that would be use the group module <laughs> and put the taxonomy terms in the group modules and assign them to that. And then you could use the permissions per group. Uh, would be something I would consider. Um, I don't know, I don't, I've only <laughs> had 10 seconds of hearing about the project, but uh, yeah. yeah. The problem comes that users has subscription time, so they should go in and out of those groups. Yeah, might be, yeah? Could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one suggestion I have for <laughs> if people want to go to the Sprint Friday, I think you're proposing that <clears throat> one place, sorry, one place to start would be this audit, right? Go mm -hmm. through core, annotate uh, screens. Uh, if people are interested in that, I think that would be a good place to start the sprint on Friday, because if you have a plan for that, this is uh, 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 non-technical work, right? This is, it should be easy to contribute to, it should be easy to divvy up the tasks, etc. So just to make it more mm -hmm. concrete and specific, I, that could be a good point to start uh, that would, that, work. Would be, that would be really nice if we had someone who people could head towards, really. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Find Antje. Yeah. Uh, the, the usability <laughs> table will be next to the accessibility table because we think <laughs> we're, we're, tr we're, we're trying to pool resources there because, for example, auditing pages is something that we don't want to develop usa nice usability um, patterns and then have the accessibility, people look at it and they're like, that doesn't work. Or they develop something different, parallel. So there's a certain overlap as well, and which is why I'm really glad to see that um, there's so much interest in accessibility. So we can piggyback usability on that a bit as well. I, 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 I'm, I'm really 
really happy to see that this room, we had a point where there was only, wasn't even enough people to sit on the floor, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is great, because there's clearly an interest, and this is something that you clearly care about. And the next step is, is taking that out of this room and doing something about it. Yeah, I, mean, I think really our, our, our talk hasn't, hasn't, doesn't fix things. It raises questions. We need you to fix it. And it, it doesn't happen by magic. It doesn't happen by somebody else fixing it. It only happens if you fix it and you do that together. So where do people go after this week? Where do we find? Um, they join us on IRC or Slack. Um, or if we ever bridge it on whatever matrix, um, they also, <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> if, uh, if you have, who, who has already plans for next Tuesday evening at nine o'clock? Okay. What what's the time zone? Uh, European standard summer time zone. Um, okay, only one, which means the rest of you can all join us in the <laughs> weekly UX, um, 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 either IRC meeting or um, Google Hangout. Um, so that's a weekly meeting that's on every Tuesday evening in Europe. In the US it's in the morning, I think. Yes, it's mm -hmm. um, For the rest, also go to your local camps, go to your sprints, go to the issue queue. Um, and if you see something that doesn't quite work, make an issue for it. Because we can also only fix the things that we know that are broken or that know that could be better. Um, Yes. You beat me to it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But yeah, th this is also, especially to the site builders that think we are just using this and we are cursing something that is on the wrong place or um, turn that cursing into some um, productive energy and into changing it. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming because it's been really good to see you all and really engaged actually some of the questions have been really great <laughs>